today, our son's lesson is still on animal kingdom. We had seen that uh, animal kingdom is divided into nine, uh, nine phylas, and we had covered from the first phylum up to the ninth, uh, ninth phylum, which is the codets. Uh, we had given slight information concerning this uh, codets phylum. We had said that uh, this phylum contains some of the large animals that we see around. And uh, we had given examples of these animals that belong to this codet uh, phylum. We had said animals we see around like the dogs, the, the animals we see around like the dogs, uh, also we said cows, they belong to this phylum, cows. Uh, we have fish, also they do belong to this phylum. We also have the birds of the air. We have the birds of the air and at the same time we also have uh, human, human beings, humans. Therefore, what we are saying that uh, most of large animals that we see around that I've described above, these animals are also referred to as vertebrates. We refer these animals as vertebrates because they have a backbone that is behind them, they have a backbone where the nerves do, um, where the nerves are attached to. So we are saying all vertebrates belong to the same phylum, the cotets. Uh, cotets are, have nerves called running down their backs. Most of the cotets have skeleton inside their bodies, therefore we can say these vertebrates or most of the cortex have skeleton inside their bodies, so we refer to them as endoskeleton. So endoskeleton is a term used to refer to animals which have the skeleton within their bodies. And most cortex have a series of small bones uh, protective, protecting the nerve cord. These small bones are called vertebrae. So we are saying, we are saying that uh, the sp uh, we are saying that the codets have a series of small bones protecting the nerve cord. The small bones are called vertebrae. The way I've written, and all together vertebrae all together the, they form what we call vertebral column. So vertebral column is made up of many strong, many small bones called vertebrae. So many vertebrae, if we bring them together, they form vertebral column. That is, or another name that we call vertebral column is the backbone. The backbone is the verte vertebral column. The group of cortex that have, uh, have the backbone are normally called the vertebrates. We are saying the group of cortex or the phylum, the group of cortex that normally have the backbone, we call them the vertebrates. All cortex have a bilateral symmetry. All cortex have a bilateral symmetry. bilateral symmetry and what we are saying with bilateral symmetry all the codex group of animals they have bilateral symmetry meaning we can be able to divide them only into equal parts we cannot divide them further and they still look similar the other parts look similar to other parts that we have indicated so we are saying all codex are bilateral symmetry
They are divided into classes based on a range of characteristics. Um, yes, uh, the, the, these characteristics include, so we are saying the quartets are largely divided um, into classes and when we are dividing them into classes, we base this division on a range of characteristics. Uh, for instance, the way they breathe. Uh, we, we are interested to know how these quartets are breathing. How do they breathe? So from the way they breathe, then we can classify them. So we are saying from the way they breathe, We want to know there are some uh, animal species which can breathe by means of lungs, others can breathe by means of gills, others can breathe by using their skin. If their skin is oily, they can be able to exchange uh, gas as exchange, take in oxygen and take outside the carbon dioxide gas. So we would like to know, we, for us to classify these codets, uh, uh, animals will learn to know how do they carry out their gaseous exchange, so the way they breathe. And we will also classify them depending on the skin covering. We have some spe species which their skin is fairy. Uh, it has hairs, others, animals, you find that their skin is scaly. So we like to know when we are trying to categorize them, what kind of skin do they have? Is it the fur, is it the hair, or are they scales? So we can still classify the quartets, uh, this, we can classify the quartets uh, species depending on the nature of the skin they have. Is it the skin, is it the fur, or is it the feathers? And then we can categorize them. Also, we do classify uh, we put them into classes depending on the body temperature. Now, when it comes to the body temperature, we are interested on how these particular species or this group of uh, quartets, how do they regulate that temperature? We have some particular species whereby they are able to generate their own heat to regulate how their heat, the, 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 their temperature is. While we have some animals which uh, they don't have the ability of regulating the heat within their body and uh, the temperature within their body will depend on the environment they're staying in. If they're in waters, if they go, they, they go to the place where the waters are so cold, then they will become cold. If they go to a place where the temperature is a bit okay, not very cold, they will change the temperature of the body depending on the environment and the surrounding. So we can also use that one to classify the species that are found within the quartet phylum. We also classify these uh, uh, quartet phylum, the animals found in the quartet phylum, depending on the way they produce. How do these animals reproduce? So how do they reproduce? There are some species when it comes to reproduction, they lay eggs, uh, uh, so that these eggs, when they age, they are able to get the young ones which are replica to them. Then we have some species, species that uh, give birth, they give birth to mature uh, offsprings, which when they are, they are born, maybe now they can feed them well. And there are some animals, they give birth to uh, animals that are not yet complete, but they still feed them in their porches as they grow. So we are interested to know how do these animal reproduce. So depending when we are following this range of characteristics, we can still classify the 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 phylum, these groupings of species, into their into their classes. So we are saying the codets have 
eight classes as follows. We shall demonstrate the eight classes of quartets. Um, so we have the quartets, and then we have uh, the phylum. So we, we are saying, uh, we do have a kind of uh, codets that, uh, um, we have codets that, uh, codets that uh, are without a backbone. So we have some species of codets that uh, don't have backbone, we have them. Then uh, we have another class of quartets called Agnatha. With uh, Agnatha, that's uh, another class of quartets. We have another class called Chondrites. Uh, Chondrites. Yes, that's another class. Um, of uh, of uh, quartets, we have another class also. Oistis, teachers, teachers. This another class, and then um, we have another class also called amphibians. That is uh, another class of uh, quartets. And then uh, we have another class called the reptiles. They have their unique characteristics, the reptiles. We have another class called the elves. The elves, um, we shall see, this is a class whereby the species um, have a number of birds that belong to uh, class Fs. And then we have the last class here called mammals. Mammals. So we are generally have close to these eight classes of quartets. And uh, we are going to look the characteristics of each of the above uh, uh, classes. Now, codets, uh, we can talk about, uh, um, uh, um, so we are saying uh, on these classes, uh, there are three classes. There are three classes of codets that uh, commonly are called which? The Agatha class, the Chondriches class, and Ostriches class, Ostage classes, they all are called the fish, they are, they, they are in a class called fish. They all live in water and uh, they breathe by use of gills. They are ectodermic by means, this means that uh, when uh, their body temperature changes depending on the whatever area they are. If they are in cold areas, then their body temperature will be cold. That's why we call them ectodermic. Ectodermic. So we are saying ectodermic is a term that we use to describe the kind of species. And here, for instance, we are talking about uh, the first uh, uh, three classes of uh, uh, these quartets. We say the body temperatures change depending on the nature and the environment that is uh, surrounding this particular species. We are uh, saying that uh, if we start, for instance, with a, a group called Aknada, and uh, this class, if we are dealing with Aknada, we say Aknada, these are uh, jawless fish. These are we have some kinds of fishes or species that belong to this uh, uh, class, another, and we are told they have jaws, but 
they, they, they don't have jaws, they are jawless fish. The only living representation of another, uh, of this kind of uh, uh, jawless fish, we have uh, hackfish. We have, we have hackfish which is jawless, it belongs to this class of another. And also we have lambrays. We also have lambrays. It is a species that belongs to this uh, uh, class of Agnatha, meaning they, they don't, they are jawless, but uh, they exist, they are jawless fish. We have these two examples, hackfish and uh, lambrids. They have internal, they have internal skeleton made of uh, cartilage. We are saying they have an internal skeleton and internal skeleton are made, made of uh, cartilage. And we are saying uh, an example of what cartilage is, if you look yourself in front of your nose, uh, your nose uh, is not made of bones, but uh, the, those, the, the substance that has been used uh, to form your nose is what we term as the cartilage. So when you place it's not completely a bone. So we are saying uh, these particular kinds of fish, the hagfish, the lambrays, they belong to a class of another, and we are saying another, they are jawless and they, they have an internal, an internal skeleton made of uh, cartilage. The another have a fin along their backs, so this kind of fishes, they have a fin behind their backs. The, they have a round mouth, uh, sucker lined with the bony teeth. So we are saying another they have a, a sucker lined with a bony teeth, which they use to attach themselves to the fish. What we are saying uh, is uh, the species found in another class, in another class, they are majorly parasites. And we know that uh, parasites, for them to exist and uh, to live, they normally attach themselves to another fish. That fish is the host. So they will depend on this fish. On They will use their teeth to ensure that uh, they are able to suck, to attach themselves to this fish and to suck blood. So we are saying the species that belong to another class, they are majorly parasites. They feed on other animals. They attach themselves to their host uh, uh, animal and they draw blood, they suck the blood. We can go to category two and uh, the class two of the quartets, we have uh, the John Riches. Oh. Yes, this class John Riches, we are seeing this is the second uh, class of uh, the quartets, and we are saying um, examples of this class, we have species like the shark. We have species like the shark, and uh, we also have uh, also another animal called the race. The sharks and the race, they belong to this class, and uh, we are told that uh, they have a skeleton made up of uh, they have a skeleton made up of uh, cartilage which gives them a common name cartilages they have also uh, the cartilages they have a skeleton that is made up of cartilage and therefore they are given a name cartilages uh, fish we are told unlike the jawless fish they have a proper jaw and teeth. They have a proper jaw and teeth. They will use the teeth for tearing and uh, uh, catch, uh, attacking its prey. So they have, they have the teeth. Shags and rays have fins on their sides. So when you look at this kind of fish, they have fins at the sides of the bodies. And at the rear of their bodies, they also they have, uh, yes, they have fins on the side of their bodies as well as at the back. They are agile swimmers. 
Agile swimmers. Um, here we are meaning, we are saying that uh, when you look at shark, if it comes to swimming, it can swim very well because it has fins along its sides and the back of their body. So they can move very fast. This uh, glass of uh, this glass of co of cadets. Then uh, we can also consider the that class of cadets, and is called osti. It is called osti. Osti uh, this this that class of cadets. It has the following characteristics. We can give. Yes, we can give an example. Uh, we can give an example for this uh, right pro up here. Yes, an example of this uh, or stage or, or, or stage or stage this. There are bony fish. We have an example. We have bony fish. We have uh, an example of bony fish. They have fins. They have fins at their back sides of their body, and they have proper jaws and and the teeth. So they have jaws and teeth. Uh, they have proper jaws and teeth. They are different from other fish because. Uh, the skeleton is made up of bones. The skeleton is made up of bones that are different from other fish, whereby the skeleton is, was made up of uh, the cartilage, if you remember. So example, uh, some of the species that are within this class of animals, we have the tuna, we have the goldfish. The goldfish belongs here. We do also have the eels and the sea horses. Eels, the sea horses. Eels, the sea horses. And the lungfish, they do belong to this group. So the lungfish, they belong to this class of cadets. Then uh, when we go to the for the group, we have uh, the amphibians. Amphibians is the fourth class of these uh, cadets. And uh, um, examples of amphibians, they have their own characteristics. But examples of species that are within this class of amphi amphibians, we have the toads. Nudes, we have the tots, the nudes, salamanders belong here. We have the salamanders, they do belong here. We are saying amphibians are cotets that live both in water and outside water. We are saying spe species that belong to the class of uh, amphibians we are saying amb amphibians are species which can live in water. At the same time, they can also live on land. And um, the, their modes of production, we say reproduction, we say they lay their eggs in water. They lay their eggs in water. They lay eggs in water. And when these eggs hatch, they hatch into larvae. Larvae, when these eggs that are laid within the water, when they hatch, they hatch into larva. Or we, some are tadpoles. They hatch into larvae or tadpoles. And uh, tadpoles and larvae, they live in water. They live in water because at uh, that young stage, they breathe through, through gills. They have gills which assist them to be able to breathe. 
and stay well in water. So we are seeing uh, the group of amphib amphibians, they do lay their eggs uh, within the water and uh, these eggs when they hatch into larvae or tadpoles, they still remain in water. But when they grow up, they are able to acquire lungs and to change the environment from water now and now they go to the land. We are told that uh, this kind of animals, so their bodies change shape as they grow and through a process called metamorphosis. So we are saying as they grow the larvae or the tadpoles, their bodies will change shape. They were having gills in the beginning, but now they will change from having gills and they will develop lungs. Once they develop lungs, now they will be able to migrate now from water to mainland. And when they are mainland, they can now breathe. But we are saying some of these, the, the, this class of animals, they will have lungs, but their lungs are not well developed to conduct uh, gaseous exchange. So we find these kind of animals, they have uh, their skin that is moist, so that even their skin can continue assisting them to, uh, to, to breathe. So we are saying that uh, once they have metamorphosized into adults, they live on land, they breathe the air using the lungs, but we are saying their lungs are not well developed, therefore such kind of animal species, they still have their skin moist so that they can continue uh, uh, exchanging, assisting. The, the moist skin can assist the lungs in gaseous uh, exchange. But uh, one thing that uh, we have to note when it comes to the animal species found here, you'll find they will, uh, uh, they will habitat areas that is close to water or damp areas or an area that is moist so that they can remain moist when they are conducting the exchange uh, for air and so forth. So we are saying that uh, amphibians have, uh, they always live near water, that's the, uh, one of the major characteristics and we are saying they are ectothermic. When we say uh, the amphibians or the tots and the salamanders that belong to this group that are ectothermic, meaning their body temperatures will change depending on the environment they are within. They will change their body temperatures depending on the environment. They don't know, they don't have the ability to generate their own heat. Um, so when they go to a cold areas, they will become extremely cold. So what happened to this animal will avoid deep waters where the waters are very cold. We can move to another class of quartets, and this class is called the reptiles. Now, when we talk of the reptiles, we have examples of reptiles that we have, some of the exam good examples we have of reptiles are the snakes that uh, we know of snakes that we have seen. We also have crocodiles. Crocodiles also are reptiles. Depending on their nature and characteristics, they do display. We also have lizards in this category. Re lizards are also uh, reptiles. And we are saying that uh, for us to be able to, to describe the characteristics of reptiles, what makes an organism or a particular species to be a reptile, then we have to check the following characteristics. One characteristic that stands out among this group of, uh, the, 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 this uh, class of quartets, we have, they have dry, scaly skin. They have dry, scaly, skin. So their skin is dry and scaly. Because their skin is dry and scaly, then this nature, this kind of species, they, unlike amphibians, they cannot be able to carry out exchange of gases using their skin because their skin is dry. So we don't expect a lizard to have a characteristic of a, a frog. A frog is an amphibian. A frog can be able to exchange the gas 
by using its skin because it's oily. But when it comes to a lizard, the skin is dry. It cannot be able to exchange uh, the gas using the, their skin. So what normally happens, they have well-developed lungs and within the using the lungs, they can be able to breathe in and out effectively. So we shall see one characteristic, they have that uh, oily skin. Two, they breathe by use of lungs. So we are saying they breathe by use of lungs. And when you say they breathe by use of lungs, their lungs are well developed, uh, unlike the, the other class of amphibians. Organisms in the amphibian class, their lungs are not well developed. And we are seeing another characteristic of the reptiles, this class. They lay their eggs with a, a, a leathery shell on land. So they do lay eggs. They lay eggs, yes, they lay eggs um, with a leathery they lay eggs with uh, uh, a leathery shell on land. So all the species that belong to this class of reptiles, they lay their eggs, and we are told how they lay their eggs. Their eggs are laid within a leathery shell on land. They don't lay their eggs in water or whatever. That is another characteristic that stands out within, within, with this class of animals. And we are saying um, most of these animals most of these uh, organisms, most of these reptiles, they spend their life cycle on land. We are seeing most of these uh, animals, they spend their life cycle They spend most of their times on land, so they don't stay in sea, but we have some few exceptions of this group of animals. For instance, we have sea snakes. The only, only exceptions, the only exceptions, we have sea snakes. Only exceptions, we have some species of sea snakes that live in water and also some lizards. That is the only exceptions, but all other reptiles they spend most of their life on land. We are saying, sea snakes do not lay eggs, but uh, the sea snakes, they do not lay eggs, but uh, they give birth uh, to young ones. The sea snakes do not lay eggs, but they give birth to young ones. And what we are saying about snakes is that uh, we have an example of a snake called uh, dead, the dead adder. The dead adder, adder is a kind of neck that is poisonous. The dead adder, uh, this is amphibians, that this is a reptile that can decide to attack human beings in case they are disturbed. If they are disrupted or they are disturbed, they can attack human beings and they are dangerous, they are poisonous. So advice is leave snakes alone, leave the dead adder alone, and they will leave you alone. You disturb it, then you will be in problems. Let us go to another group of quartets, another class of quartets, and uh, this class is called the Aves. The sixth group is called the Aves. Aves, uh, the, the group of animals or species that belong to aves are normally the birds. So we are saying, example of the aves, we have uh, the famous flamingo. Flamingos uh, belong to this group of, uh, of aves. 
Also, we have the penguins. Also, the penguins, the penguins belong to this group of elves. We are saying elves, uh, elves are biological name, elves is a biological name for the birds. They are different from other animals. We are saying elves are different from other animals because the features that stand out that differentiate the elves from other species are one, first characteristics of the elves, they have feathers. You know, with other animals, they lack feathers, but we are saying one feature that is uh, observed among this group of species, we are saying they have feathers, and these feathers are used to cover their body. Feathers covering their bodies. Uh, that one being one of the characteristics that distinguishes this kind of, uh, this group of elves from other organisms. We are also saying they lay hard-shelled eggs. They lay eggs. We are saying they lay eggs uh, compared to uh, similar to reptiles, but we are saying they lay hard shelled eggs, that is a characteristic that they have. And uh, this, uh, and this group of species, the elves, they have wings. Whether those wings can be used for flying or not, but they have them. Some of the birds can use the wings to swim in water. For instance, if we are giving an example of the Penguins, they use their, their wings to fly in water. But uh, if we give an example of an ostrich, it has wings, but it cannot fly. But still, it has that characteristic, it has wings. Large animals, do it cannot fly, but uh, it has wings. So we are saying, um, birds have wings, including those that can't fly. Like, for instance, the penguins cannot fly, but they will use their uh, their, their, their wings to swim fast in water. Maybe we can call the, the, the penguins are birds that fly in seas or they fly in water. Then we are saying birds have another uh, distinguishing characteristics. We are saying that uh, birds are endodemic. We are saying birds, uh, they are endodemic endodermic, meaning birds have the ability to generate their own heat. They can be able to control and to regulate their own temperatures. Unlike the reptiles which are uh, ectodermic, ectodermic implying that their body temperature will change depending on the environment. But when we come to the birds, they are able to generate their own heat so they can regulate their own temperature. And then, um, so when we say they are able to generate their own heat, then uh, the fifth characteristic that comes up is they regulate their own, they regulate their own temperature. So whether you can find a bird is in a cold area, their temperature will not change depending on that environment. An area can be of low temperature, but we still find these birds are warm because they have the ability to generate their own temperature. Uh, when we talk of animals that fly, maybe we should not fail to mention that uh, we have uh, an organism that belongs to a cotate group, and it's called a bat. We are saying birds, birds fly, I'm talking about uh, this one, but fly, but they are mammals because they are able to to uh, to give milk to their young ones and so forth. So we cannot say now a bat belongs to the group of elves. It has no feathers. So a bat are known known the cotets. Yes, they have wings and they are mammals, but they do, we cannot say birds belong to the group of elves. No, 
They can fly, they have their wings, they don't have feathers. They, they are mammals, they reproduce, they give birth to their young ones. They feed them with milk. So th we can see those are flying mammals, we cannot bring them into this category. We shall see where they fall. We can go to this group seven, the mammals themselves. Now, um, this class of quartets, the mammals, um, this is a class of mammals, th this class of mammals include animals that have their bodies, their bodies are covered by hair. That's one of the characteristics of species that belong to a class of mammals. We are saying their bodies are covered by hair. Uh, another good and unique characteristics, apart from the hair covering, Second characteristics we, of identifying the mammals, we try to see the way they feed their babies. We are told uh, they feed their babies on milk produced by the mother. They feed their babies with milk pr produced by the mothers. Yes, they feed their babies with the food, with milk that is produced uh, by their mothers. We are saying that uh, mammals, another important characteristic uh, of mammals is uh, they are into endodermic. When we say they are endodermic, meaning mammals are able to generate their own heat and therefore they can regulate their own heat, generate their own heat and regulate their temperatures. They, they can regulate their own temperatures. We are saying mammals, now when we are talking about mammals, we are also told that mammals are subdivided into three subclasses. So mammals have subdivided into three subclasses. We can, we can identify these three uh, subclasses that mammals belong. One, we call them, the first one we call it uh, the placentals. Now, when we, the subclass of the class mammals, the placentals. The placentals are uh, mammals that uh, nourish their babies inside their mother's body using the placenta. So the placentals are mammals that have a placenta within them and when they're feeding their young ones, when the young ones are still in their body, that placenta is used to feed these young babies within, the, within them until they are mature before they are born. So we are saying the placentals are able to feed the young ones within their bodies by use of the placenta until the, 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 until the baby that is uh, to be born is mature. So they give birth to mature uh, babies that have been fed well within the bodies of these mammals. So such a mammals, you call them the placentas. And uh, examples of placenta animals, we have the seals, we have, yes, examples of this, we have the, we have the cells, they belong to that group there, we have the horse, horses, horses are able to feed their young ones using the placenta before, until they are mature and then they are born. We have the wells, wells belong here. We have flying foxes. Flying foxes are birds. The birds that fly, we have the flying foxes. They also have these uh, characteristics. Um, 
And then um, another, another class, another class of, another subclass of these mammals, we have uh, the monotremes. We have the monotremes, and on, on the monotremes, we are told uh, they have a unique characteristics. They do lay eggs. The monodreams do lay eggs. This subclass consists of only two species. They consist of only two species that are known. The Echida, Echida, and another species is called the Platypus. Platypus. So these are the only uh, monostreams that we have under the second uh, subclass of the, the mammals. The, that group we have uh, uh, the mass, uh, we have a third group called the marsupials. And uh, we are saying the marsupials are, uh, 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 they, they, they are able to give birth to undeveloped young ones. Once they give birth to undeveloped young ones, these young ones are placed in some porch so that once they are still in these porches, they are fed and they grow up and then they become fully developed. So we are seeing examples of these marsupials. We have uh, this uh, species called wombat. That is the, uh, one of the examples that we can give about the marsupials. The animals that have some porches whereby when they give birth to undevel undeveloped young ones, they are able to give them the porches and they feed them until they are fully developed. Um, uh, we are still on this animal kingdom. We shall have some few exercises to, to deal with some questions that can give us a better understanding whether we can use the information we have gathered through all the nine uh, phyla of animal kingdom. The kinds of questions that we are going to deal with, there are questions which uh, will need you to remember, to recall some important information. There are questions which will want you to describe, to analyze, to apply the information that you have gained while going through the nine phylums. For instance, we can have our first exercise, uh, question number one. Question number one, which requires recall, remember, and so forth. First question is, list the nine phyla of animals. So list the nine phyla of animal kingdom. This question requires only you to remember. To remember that the animal kingdom has got nine phyla, starting from the porifferans, the annelids, the nematodes, and so forth. The arthropods, Oh, these are the examples, these are examples of the animal uh, phylum that, uh, made, ma ma that make up the animal kingdom. So once you want to respond to them, you need just to recall and remember, then you can write them down. We have the mol molas and so forth. Uh, molas. And uh, we have another phylum. Um, Sidarian. Yes, we have the Sidarian. Um, uh, 
Now, we are saying the first question, it, it requires you just to remember the kinds of phylum that we have covered, the phyla that we have covered in animal kingdom. Now, when we go to the second question, um, the second question, we, cannot, we can call it, the first can be question number 1A, we can have question number 1B. Now, question number 1B, um, it also requires you to show a symbol, re remembering and recall is a matter of knowledge. The question is, name the phylum to which human beings belong. Name the phylum. Name the phylum to to which human beings belong. To which humans belong? This is just a question that requires us as students to know where do we belong because students are part of a human being. We need to know we are, we are in the animal kingdom. Now in this animal kingdom we have seen it has got nine phyla. Which phylum do we belong? And if you are keen enough, you know that uh, human beings belong to the phylum called cordates. We belong to that uh, phylum called cordates. And uh, when you go to more classes, we shall discover that human beings are mammals and uh, so forth. And then um, uh, we can now have uh, question number two that can give us a uh, 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 understanding. Uh, the question number two is describe the differences between exoskeleton and endoskeleton. So question number two, we can say that is question 2A. And if it is question 2A, it requires us to give some explanation. Describe, describe the differences between exoskeleton exoskeleton and endoskeleton. Now, this question to um, for you to be able to tackle it well, you need to know the nature of skeletons that are talking. And we know the nature of skeleton, some of the skeleton are made of bones, and these bones are there to protect the nerve endings from being destroyed. Some of the skeleton we had seen that they are, they are made of cartilage, others are made of bones. So whenever we talk of exoskeleton, exoskeleton, this, this is a skeleton that is outside the body, it is outside. It's covering the organs of the body. This, this we, we call it exoskeleton because it's outside the body. And a better example of an exoskeleton are the anthropods. The insects we have, their skeleton is an exoskeleton. So it is outside their body. It's there to assist the insects so that they can move well in terms of locomotions and so forth. And uh, when we come to to, when we come to describing, when we come to describing the second kind of uh, 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 of skeleton, the endoskeleton, we say the endoskeleton is a skeleton that is within the particular species. So it is within, and it is there to protect the body organ. So the major difference between exoskeleton is we outside the outside the body of a particular organism and endoskeleton is within the body of a particular uh, living organism. Another question that we can term this question to be B, name the group of animals that have endo, 
name the group of animals that have exoskeleton. Symbol recall, name the group of animals that have exoskeleton. So we are saying nature, this, the, the nature of the question simply requires you to have knowledge, to have read and to have understood. So the na the naming the group of animals that uh, have exoskeleton, the group of animals that belong to this group are anthropods. And when we talk of the anthropods, they have an outside skeleton. We, it is, we have a group of animals called the anthropods. These anthropods is where we have the insects and so forth, they belong to this category. So if we give a nature of uh, the animals that belong, living organisms that are there, we have the insects. So the nature of the skeleton they have, it is an exoskeleton. Then, um, Question C, which will be last, this question C, which also requires uh, knowledge. Name a group of animals. Yeah, name a group of animals that have endoskeleton. So when we say name a group of animals that have endoskeleton, so the group of animals that have endoskeleton, endoskeleton, If you have the correct knowledge, you have read, then you know that the group of animals that have endoskeleton are the cordets. Where we have human beings as among the, the, the group. Now we can have a question, another exercise uh, in this animal kingdom we can have question 3A. And uh, question 3A requires us to explain why frogs need to live in damp places. Explain why frogs need to live in damp places. Explain why frogs need to live in damp places, but lizards can survive in dry areas. For you to approach this nature of questions, you need to explain why frogs cannot exist in areas where the lizards can do well and exist. To, to explain this question, we need to know that uh, a frog happens to be in the class of uh, the amphibians, and we had said the amphibians, they don't have a well-developed lungs. Remember, amphibians are a kind of animal at the younger stages, they are in water. We say amphibians are able to lay their eggs in water. When this water, when these eggs hatch into larva or the tadpoles, they have gills. They breathe, but as they metamorphosize, as they grow, they are able to develop lungs. And once they develop these lungs, they now migrate from water to mainland. But we are saying that because their lungs are not well developed, developed, they need to stay in damp areas, they need to stay in moist areas, so that their skin are always moist. So that when the skin are always moist, they will be able to, uh, to assist. They will be able to assist the... They will be able to assist the, 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 the animal when it comes to gaseous exchange. But when we talk of lizard, the lizard is a, belongs to a group of reptiles. They have well-developed lungs. Because they have well-developed lungs, they can be able to carry out breathing in and breathing out quite well. That's why the lizards can exist well in dry areas. Um, 
As we finish with the last question, we can have a last question. Um, identify the features below. Identify the figures below, whether they represent radial or bilateral symmetry. We shall try to construct these figures to the ability that can be one of the figures. We need to know whether we can use, we can, it can represent radial symmetry or bilateral. Another figure, we can have it this way. That is another figure. And um, the other figure as we wind up. That is another figure. So we can say we are having three figures and we want to see what, what nature of these figures, what do they represent? Which one can represent the radial or uh, bilateral symmetry? When we had talked about radial, we said you can divide a particular uh, organism into several, several parts, but whichever, how, whichever way you divide, they are extremely equal, as long as you're dividing them uh, through the center. So if we take this figure and we say this is the center, and we say we are dividing this uh, particular figure this way, then we can see we are getting two equal parts. We can also use this other side it is also subdivided into two equal parts. If we decide to subdivide, to, subdivide, to subdivide it this way, passing through the center, we are still getting equal parts. So we can say the first figure is a true representation of radial uh, symmetry. When we go to the second figure, and uh, we don't know how we can subdivide this way or this way, we only see that the second figure pre presents us uh, with a chance of only subdividing it once so that we can get two equal parts. So when you subdivide it this way, then there will be two equal parts. So this one represents bilateral. That's bilateral symmetry. You can only get two equal parts that are replica to each other. Then the last figure that looks like a cone, if you want to subdivide it uh, again, yeah, it looks like a cylinder. When, once, when we want to subdivide it into equal parts, uh, uh, we can, if we cut it down this way, if we cut it down this way, then we can get two parts that are exactly uh, the same, the same. What about if we cut it across this way? If we cut it across this way, uh, the two parts will not be the same. The di where will the difference come from? Depending on whether it has a base or not. If it has the base, it will be difficult. It will be different. But if it has an opening up and down and, and you subdivide it in the middle, then this one can qualify to be bilateral. It can also be uh, radial symmetry. Because if the base is opening, it can also represent a radial symmetry because you can divide it this way and you can divide it this way and you get two halves that are equally the same. Um, um, we shall cover another example in the next lesson where we shall, we shall compare the masses of animals, for instance an uh, African elephant and a whale you find that an African elephant has got 5,000, 5, for instance, for 5,000 kilograms, and the whale has got 190 kilograms. So how many times is a whale heavier than an African elephant? That one is a question of division, but what we are saying, uh, we have covered animal kingdom 
in our next lesson, we shall cover plant kingdom. Also, plants is a kingdom. We have only finished one kingdom. We want to go to another kingdom. And when we finish all the kingdoms, there will be five kingdoms. That is the end of the lesson today. Thank you.